What are some of the pockets of inflation you're seeing in your business and how long do you expect that to stick around? Yeah, look, we're seeing it come through in a number of different areas and particularly talking to our, our customers, they are too, but particularly in supply chains, in technology, obviously any reliance on uh, inbound or outbound uh, shipping routes. We do think that there's going to be inflationary pressure going through into next year. Our economics team is forecasting a cash rate increase at the end of 2022. But as you know, there's a there's a big divide between, I think, what the market is expecting and how that translates into wages and strong demand for labour next year versus what the central bank is currently forecasting. So, you know, our view is there's going to be strong economic growth in, uh, in 2022, you know, very low unemployment rate. Some of those supply chain issues will persist and we'll see uh, some higher inflation than certainly we've seen for many years. You mentioned the labour market tightness and we've been talking about the great resignation across the globe as well. What have you been seeing in your business and how reliant is that part of the market on Australia really opening its borders to international migration and tourists once again? Yeah, I mean, just about every business that I've spoken to certainly is very focused on uh, retaining and also just access to labour. So certainly as uh, borders are opening uh, during the course of next year and getting access to, you know, both highly skilled, but also you know, international students that you mentioned, I think that's certainly a, a big positive. We're, we're not seeing at this stage some of the forces that you've seen in you know, markets like the US where there's very significant sort of uh, increases in uh, in turnover, but we're very focused on making sure we're you know, retaining our best people. I'm sure all businesses are. It's definitely, you know, it's a good time to be in, uh, in certain industries. Um, there's a lot of competition and demand and, you know, employers rightfully are very focused on keeping their, their best people. And that's certainly going to continue uh, into next year. Let's turn to crypto for a sec. You have been more bullish on that asset class than many other global bankers. You've now got a partnership with Gemini, so your customers on the app can buy, hold and sell crypto assets. Why are you more bullish on that asset class? Yeah, I mean, it's important to say we don't have a, a view on the asset price itself. You know, we see it as a very volatile and speculative uh, asset, but we also don't think that the sector and the technology is going away anytime soon. And so we want to understand it. We want to provide a competitive offering to customers, you know, with the right disclosure around risks. We want to build capability in and around uh, DLT or blockchain technology. Uh, I think there's going to be lots of different variations of forms and we've seen a lot of interest from customers. But we also think over the medium term, a lot of potential applicability and we want to be part of that we see risks in participating, but we see bigger risks in not participating. And you've taken investments in tech companies before. Would a crypto investment be something on your list, whether it be Gemini or another crypto business? Yeah, I mean, per se, we're not looking for an investment in a crypto company. But what, as you said, one of the, the models that's worked very well and successfully for us is for people that we're partnering with. And you mentioned Gemini, we've entered into a you know, what we hope is going to be a long-term partnership. We've certainly been very impressed with their capabilities. We quite like the model of where we're taking a you know, small minority interest. I think it shows commitment uh, from our perspective. It, it drives alignment. You know, it's often we see as um, you know, part of what we'd like from a, a partner that we're working with exclusively, and we're very open to doing that. Australia as a country, though, has been a little bit behind on crypto and regulation around crypto and whether there's a centralised currency or not. What are your views on what Australia needs to do on that front? Well, I think it's a really important topic, you know, in terms of what is the future of the financial system, the future of money. There's some really interesting, I think, and fundamental policy implications. I mean, recently there was a payments review. I know the sector itself within crypto has been looked at uh, closely. You know, policymakers and regulators are actually very active uh, in this sp space at the moment. There's real ambiguity and uncertainty about what's the best way to both foster the innovation, but also make sure there are appropriate regulations and safeguards for, for customers. So we see it as an important part of our role to just work closely with you know, policymakers and government and try and get strike the right uh, balance. We're committed to, to doing that. But, you know, I think internationally it's an area where there's you know, a lot of uh, innovation and growth. I mean, it's grown enormously. If you look at this, the dollars that are going into that sector over particularly uh, the last two years. And then 
as part of that policy is, well, many central banks are looking at the applicability of a central bank digital currency. What would that look like? What would the benefits of that? And, you know, again, that's something that we'd like to participate in. We think it's important that Australia is building capability and, you know, piloting different um, versions of, uh, of the future. And, um, yeah, we're hopeful that we can play a role in that. Matt, your love of tech doesn't extend to the whole tech sector, though, particularly big tech. You've spoken out against Apple a fair bit, describing them as a threat to the financial system in payments. Could you detail what the risks are there? And do you think that regulation, um, do we really want over-regulation? No, I mean, no one wants over-regulation. <laughs> and, and obviously trying to strike that right balance. I do think, um, you know, for many large players just looking at uh, the way they can use and exert their market power uh, you know and Apple's no different certainly not exempt from that we I guess have a particular issue with uh, restrictions or access around the NFC or the antenna on a on an Apple device I think in Australia they have a very strong market share uh, of the handset uh, they have very strong market share uh, in terms of electronic payments uh, and particularly you know, at point of sale. And clearly that's, that's increased rapidly uh, during COVID. And so there's a, you know, I guess a competition element of, you know, making sure that there's, you know, a fair and level playing field across all players. It's not about the Commonwealth Bank. We, we would suggest that all players across multiple industries uh, should, should and, and can have access to the NFC securely and protecting customers' privacy. And you're seeing that play out in, you know, in other landmark cases around the world where you know, a number of different uh, players are sort of looking at what's the role of big tech and you know, how they're conducting themselves in their businesses and you know, is there the appropriate level of uh, you know, protection and uh, level playing field for all. And finally, on China as Australia's biggest bank, how do you see Australia's relationship with China at the moment and what are the risks of not uh, improving that? Well, I mean, they're a very important uh, trading partner. I think everyone realises that. It's also, again, it's a very complex uh, situation uh, and, and the dynamics. And I, you know, I certainly don't want to, you know, sort of step into, you know, how to best manage that relationship. I think for many customers and particularly, you know, over the last 12 or 18 months where there have been restrictions and uh, on access to international markets, I mean, Generally, uh, you know, many Australian companies have been able to diversify away from single markets. I think you know, it's, a, it's a part of appropriate risk management is thinking about that. But yes, it's been challenging, but we also have to look at the, the broader implications of the relationship over the, over the long term. And if, you know, of course, everyone would like there to be sort of great alignment and there to be you know, mutually beneficial. Uh, but there are also important issues uh, at, at play, which you know, need to be managed appropriately by the government.